Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And Scott and I are just really going crazy for today's guest. And uh, before we talk about our guest and the problems of our guest and the shiny object syndrome that Scott Todd uh, had to go through because of our guest, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce Six Sigma. You know him. You love him. Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com, and most importantly, if not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Scott Todd, are you, are you ready for this? Mark, I, I think we, first of all, we have to do some disclaimers. One, okay. if you are subject to shiny object syndrome, uh, you may, may want to, to proceed with, with this podcast with caution first. Okay. And I, I know from experience, I, uh, I went down this path, not too far down the path before my wife slammed me back in to the right, right. Uh, you know, thinking that, that helped me continue on my land investing career, but Gene is here and he's going to like rearm me with some data that I can share with my wife and like, I don't know, come back to her. All right. So for those of you that love passive income and most everybody who's listening to this podcast loves passive income, today's guest is most likely going to blow your mind with ultimately what we're going to make the argument is, does he have the best passive income model? I think we do, but we'll see. Gene is the president, CEO, and founder of RALacademy.com. Gene has over 30 years of experience in real estate investing and business. And today, Gene is focused on just one thing, investing in the mega trend of senior assisted housing. He is our first guest to even talk about senior assisted living. Having trained tens of thousands of investor entrepreneurs over the past 25 years, he now specializes in helping others take advantage of this mega trend opportunity. Gene Guarino, RAL hey. Academy, welcome to the podcast. I'm so scared right now that <laughs> after this podcast, I'm going to start looking for uh, assisted living centers. But Mark, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be. Gene, tell us, I, tell us how you got into this your whole story. I love it. I'm putting fear into the hosts of the show. I love it. Fear in a good way, though. <clears throat> this whole idea of shiny object, you know what? This is something that I guarantee every one of your listeners is going to get involved in one way or the other. You're either going to own the real estate, you're going to be part of the business, or you're going to be lying in a bed writing a check to somebody else to take care of you or a loved one. No escaping it, though. You're all going to get involved. All right. Well, I, I, I think I'd rather be the one getting the checks than writing the checks. <laughs> So that's a good play. So, all right. So tell, so tell us about your story. Cause God's like, you gotta listen to this guy's story. So for me, I heard about, I heard about assisted living from a business perspective about 15 years ago. And when the person who shared it with me told me it was from the front of the room in a real estate presentation, I said, wow, that's great. Then I said, tell me more. And he said, well, I can't, that's all I know. I just know it's good. And, and I was disappointed. He was not a practitioner. He was just telling me you should do it. So then about four years ago, my mother started to need help. Uh, she was getting older in her 80s, hard time medication management, taking care of herself, and now we faced it. And as a baby boomer, and a lot of us are, it's now our turn to now take care of mom and dad. So what do you do? You start asking those questions. Where do you go? What do you do? What do you ask? And when it came time to get that help, we realized, wow, there's not really a great solution for us. I didn't want to put mom in a big box, as we call it, like an apartment or hotel. She lived in a house and she wanted to stay in her own house, but we couldn't take care of her ourselves. So what do we do? So at that moment, I vowed to create the solution. And the solution we created was a home assisted living. So residential assisted living that I'd be proud to have my own mom and my own dad move into. And as soon as I did that, others asked me how to do the same. And that's exactly where we started the Residential Assisted Living Academy. Scott, why are you smiling? Because Mark, like, like Gene just said, like I, the, the, the shiny object is like glaring at me. That's, you know, like, but like Gene said, this isn't like right down the street from my house, Mark, they're building, they're building this massive, like uh, community assisted living community. Okay. Like it, it, they're proud of it. It's like this massive thing. I don't know how many people it's going to house hundreds. Okay. 
and they're taking and they're dumping a ton of capital into this building, right? It's, it's strictly development, right? Like they're taking the land, they're developing it, they're putting in the, the, the infrastructure, all that stuff. And key, and, and Gene just said a key word, residential. <laughs> yeah. Well, Gene, let, let me share a story about my grandma. Um, sure. About, I want to say, oh my gosh, it's almost 20 years now. My, my grandma has a sudden stroke. Mm. Okay. And, you know, my grandfather's older and we have the same personal situation, what you just described, right? So we, you know, she gets out of the hospital. We can't take care of her. She's like a former shell of her former self. Mm. And we put her in the big box, right? The nursing home. Yeah. And all of a sudden, one day, she is lucid and she is clear as day. Mm. In, in her, in, and she's recovered from this massive stroke and she is pissed. She wants to be home. Mm. She does not want to be in this facility. And I mean, I'm talking angry and you want to talk about a depressing situation going to visit her. Um, it, it, it was really depressing. So how is your model different and how, how can we all take advantage of it? Well, I know that when I went to go look for the solution for mom, uh, it, you could smell the neglect as soon as you walked through the front door. And it didn't smell like home. It didn't feel like home. And as even with the nice new places, they work really hard on trying to make these big, huge, massive complexes, like you said, Scott, feel like home. So why not start where they're trying to end up, with a home? So I was looking for a home because think of mom. She's been living in a house for 85 years. Everybody else, for the most part, has passed on and you know, you, you stop over and check out how she's doing once in a while, but she needs friends, peers, peers her own age. So to be in an environment where she can hang out with people her own age, and I don't mean 400 people, right? That's like, I, I'm not a crowd person. I'll go to a ball game once in a while, but I'd rather be at home with, a, with family than I would be in a hotel with hundreds of people. So when we went to go visit the big boxes, I call it facilities, we went there and it just... It wasn't home. It was eye candy for the kids, me and my brothers and sisters. Like, wow, wouldn't this be great? Mom can, you know, she can watch movies. She can go to the dining hall. She can go here and there. No, she wanted to be at home. So the idea of being in a home with, let's say, 10 other people, and in Arizona, we can have up to 10 people in that residential setting. Now they can have those personal relationships. They can get to know each other. The caregivers, instead of somebody showing up for a shift, there's one caregiver for every 50. So you really get to nervous are there's that personal connection right there and the ability to really interconnect and take care of those parents, those moms and dads or grandma and grandpa really becomes important because it's not the house. It's the care that they're receiving. You want a place where mom is safe. She's well taken care of. She's provided for, but it's a comfortable home. And there's a lot of money to be made, but it's a do good, do well. We're doing something that's really good for a lot of people, and we're able to make a lot of money and do very well. Well, let, let's talk about the lot of money, and let's talk about the economics of it. How does this whole thing work? In the U.S., the national average is $3,600 per person per month for a private room and assisted living. So that's the average. That goes from everything from private pay, which is what I focus on, to government pay, which I do not want your listeners to focus on. Medicare, Medicaid, they only pay a few thousand dollars a month. You're not going to be able to run a successful business and make a profit. It's a charity and it's a good thing, but you're not going to be successful. So 3,600 is the median. And I'm going to tell you now, and you're in Arizona as I am. Scott, where are you at? What state? Florida. Florida. <laughs> So Florida is the same, God's waiting room, <laughs> just, you know, between us both, between Florida and Arizona, there's millions of seniors, but, you know, the bottom line is 3,600 is the average, so we're looking at above average, four, five thousand, six, eight thousand per person per month. If grandma knew what it was costing per month to take care of her, she'd have a heart attack and die right there. So she doesn't really know, but let's just say it's 4,000 a month times 10 people, that's 40000 a month in gross income. After you pay all the expenses, caregivers, manager, house, food, everything, you're netting 10000 12000 15000 per month 
from that one single home, that one single residential assisted living business. And that's very lucrative. And that's not, that's a a 25% EBITDA. Yeah, exactly. 30% is what we shoot for from the bottom line down 30%. So 25% is good. 30% is what our target is, but that's not you working in the business 40 hours a week or 60 hours a week. What we share with our students, what we do is what we call a three pack. You have a management team and they're overseeing, let's say three homes. It sounds better than a six pack, right? But you can do more than three, but a number of homes, one management team. So if you're putting in five or 10 hours a week overseeing the business, managing the manager, and that's what I do, imagine having three of those homes making 10 grand each or more per home per month. That's what we're talking about. That's the do well, doing good, but doing very, very well. Scott, I see where the, uh, the shiny object, object syndrome can, comes, in, comes in. So I'm sold on the economics of it. But I'm not sold on the headache piece of getting started because what I'm seeing now is going and getting funding for a house. I've got to hire a management team, right? I got to find good people to take care of these people. All right. Let me help you. You know what? My head's now I'm getting a headache. Now I'm going back to land investing, Scott. There you go. Well, let me get back to your passive income model because there's two parts to this. There's real estate on one side, business on the other. So first I want you to think from the real estate side, you can just own the real estate. And if you have a home and you rent it out now and get positive cash flow after all expenses of $200 a month, which is kind of an average, great, 200 bucks a month. But if you could rent that same home for twice the fair market rent, so if you're renting it for two grand and you're making 200 a month, if you rented it for four grand, the extra 2000 is straight profit into your pocket. How would you like, would that be okay? Keep going. Good. And, and your tenant is not a family with two kids, a dog, a mom, a dad. It's, it's a business that's being operated. We call it a group home for seniors. It's called different things in different states. It's called something, it's ALF, assisted living facilities in Florida. It's assisted living homes in Arizona. It's personal care homes in Georgia. It's called different things in different states. But that, that resident themselves is the person who's living in the house, but who's actually leasing it from you is the person who's operating the business. So if I'm going to rent your home and I'm going to pay twice the fair market rent, why would I do that? Because I'm making a boatload of money. Even after paying you twice the fair market rent, I'm netting 10 grand or more each month. I'm willing to do that because you bought the house, came up with the down payment, did the financing, did all the things that we do as real estate investors. We all have to keep in mind, I've been doing real estate investing for 30 years. We know how to do this stuff. A lot of people don't. And especially people that operate this business, they know their business, they don't know real estate. So the concept of renting it and then paying twice the fair market rent, they also don't want to get kicked out after a year. They're going to say, I need a five-year lease. And they're not going to be trashing the house. They're going to be keeping it very nice from the outside, curb appeal. And on the inside, the people actually living there, grandma, grandpa, it's not like they're having keggers till midnight. They're not raising Rottweilers in the back bedroom, dissecting Harley Davidson's in the front room. They're in bed by 715. So you have low impact tenants with a long-term lease at twice the fair market rent. And if you like that kind of passive income, you can just stop right there and we're done. Ooh. (laughs) <laughs> that is that is sexy, isn't it? All right. Well, let's let's not stop there, though. No, let's, let's not stop there. Yeah, let's not stop there because I, I want to know the Gene Guarino way of doing it. There you so go. So what exactly does Gene do? You got it. But that right there, I, again, for those of you listening saying, that's what I want. I just want passive income, own the house, lease it out, fair, twice the fair market rent, let's say, and then long-term tenant, low impact. That's a really cool, sexy, let's love that there. On the other side, the reason why you can pay twice the fair market rent is because somebody's doing everything you said. They're renovating the house, getting it licensed, hiring people. Now, I want you to think about the business of assisted living as a fine dining restaurant. In a fine dining restaurant, we went out last night with some friends to a restaurant. The restaurant is, is the food was amazing. The chef, the wait staff was very attentive. The, everything was there. But if you just turn up the lights and empty it out, it's just a building. Real estate is real estate. The restaurant is all about the chef, the staff, the food, and so on. Care home is the same thing. So the real estate passive income, what's the cap rate? We get X. 
But on the care home side, that's where we get a 25% EBITDA. On. You understand that. The listeners may or may not. But the point is, you're going to get that massive return because you're doing the work. You're doing something more. If you don't want to do it, just own the real estate, lease it out. If you do want to do it, I'm telling you, do one of these. And I'll give you two reasons why. Do just one of these. You could be set for life. I think a lot of people work way too hard. They, they got into real estate with a goal of, I want to make money. They do fix and flip. They make 30 grand and they say, that's great. At the end of the year, they have to give, you know, 12,000 of that to the government and say, well, that wasn't fun. I wasn't prepared for that. Plus, as soon as they sell it, they're out of business because now they have to go find another one to get back in business. So then we go to buy and hold passive investors. And that's great till the tenant moves out and takes the kitchen with them, right? They trash the house, there goes your profit for the year. So then we go to let's do 100 unit apartments where now we have some scale, we hire a manager, we're more passive, we're hands off, but it's still a rental, it's still a turnover, it's still a business. But the cap rate itself, whether it be 4% in California or 12% in Pennsylvania, it's still a cap rate and it's still limited too. But here's the deal, with the senior housing, there is a silver tsunami coming that you just cannot stop. A silver let's, tsunami. Let's talk about that silver tsunami that we can't stop. Let's, let's talk about the demographics because I, I know it, but I don't know if the listeners know how big this market is. Scott, do you know how big this market is? It's huge. I'll tell you I, what. It's massive. Just talking to Gene, I feel like I've aged 20 years. I'm ready. Well, that's from looking at me. See, I mean, you guys are younger than I am, but right now the people listening, baby boomers, there's 77 million baby boomers in the U.S. Now, if you're like me, you, you read into that and go, well, hold it. Some of those people have died. You're right. 12 million of those baby boomers have died. But get this, 11.6 million immigrants who are 65 or above have moved in to replace them. Boom. We're still at 77 million. So that's an average of 10,000 people every day turning 65 years old. Now, they're not moving into assisted living, but 4,000 people a day are turning 85 years old. That's your demographic. That's the target. That's the fastest growing demographic in the country, period. People are living longer than ever. And there's less kids. So I came from a family with seven kids. I'm one of seven kids. A lot of kids to help take care of mom and dad. But if you've only got two kids in the family, who's going to quit their job and take care of mom and dad? So they are lasting longer. They need the help. Where are they going to go? So this silver tsunami, the baby boomers, the oldest baby boomers, 71 years old, Mick Jagger, 73. He's kind of ahead of the curve. I use the Rolling Stones as kind of a, a benchmark because most people know who they are. The youngest Rolling Stone, by the way, is Ronnie Woods, the replacement guitar player. He's the only true baby boomer in the Stones. He's 69. And then you got Mick Jagger at 73, you got Charlie Watts at 75, and then Keith Richards, he's the oldest of all. He's 307. <laughs> That's a joke, but anyway. I'm well, you know what? I, if you've read his biography, he probably <laughs> mentally I, – actually, I, I had a history of rock and roll teacher told me that his version of hell was a thought escaping Keith, Keith Richards' head. <laughs> from all the drugs okay but that's let's let's we digress all right so we had this we had this massive market gene but yep. we also have massive liability right because these people we're taking care of them and if <laughs> one thing goes wrong kids get mad and they sue scott todd because mom didn't like the fish mom fell in the kitchen why was it slippery dad right. is really angry that mom missed her medication at noon, right? Okay. So let's what do we do with that? that? Let's dig into it. <laughs> First of all, when it comes to assisted living, it's a business and we have professional liability insurance specifically for the business. It's not medical malpractice because it's not a medical institution. It's less than a dollar a day per resident. Mine's about 65 cents a day per resident. So 10 people, 30 days, $300 a month. It's a line item on my expenses. But here's the deal. I know what my risks are. I'm dealing with the elderly. I know they're going to fall. I know they're going to break bones. I know that they're going to die. Boom. They're going to die. We know it. They're old. Now, here's the thing. When you have a house and there's a pool and the four-year-old invites a friend over and the kid tragically drowns in the pool, that's tragic. Nobody's expecting that. That's where mom and dad get totally upset. When grandma's 90 years old and she's been paying $5,000 a month in an assisted living home, the kids at this point, if mom dies, no, when mom dies, right? It's not if, it's when. 
it's not unexpected. It's not anything other than it's her time. And literally, and I don't mean to be crass, some of those kids, one of them at least internally is going to say, I'm glad that's over. You know, it's 5000 a month draining down my inheritance that I would have gotten. She lasted longer than we thought. So it's not a surprise. Now, if there's neglect and abuse and so on, completely different thing. But all of those horror stories that you hear on the big box side, because the big box has 200 residents, they've got four caregivers taking care of them. And there is neglect, there is problems because there is no accountability. When you've got a home with 10 residents and two caregivers, you know who the caregiver is. There's no escaping it. You know who it is, who they are, what they do. So that's not the issue. There's liability insurance. We know what our risks are. And if you do things right, asset protection on one side, liability insurance on the immediate, and you run a good operation, it's approved by the state, and you follow the rules and so on, it's less of an issue than it is for the average person renting out apartments to somebody else. I think Gene just dropped the mic on me, Scott. Scott, can you, uh, can you, can you shoot an arrow at, at, at Gene, please? Somebody? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, literally, like everything, because I'm telling you, Mark, I, I, I warned you. I warned you before we started, like shiny object syndrome, here we come, right? Like the, the thing is, is that, um, you know, it's, it's take, I mean, we know this is going to happen, right? Like you can see it coming. You can see the, the tidal wave coming and you know, what are you going to do about it? You know, because it, it will transform. I think this wave will transform all of real estate. You know, we're seeing a transformation now on the commercial real estate side with mm. shopping centers, et cetera. <laughs> you know, like they're just closing the, the, the retailers are just closing and you know, we're, we're seeing less and less home ownership, in the country, okay? More and more uh, rental ownership. And as people are getting older, they're not gonna buy houses. They're not, they're, they're, I, I mean, I just read an article yesterday that said that um, more and more people are getting divorced in their 60s and they are becoming the new rental generation because why are they gonna go buy a house in their 60s? They're not, they're not gonna do it. So now you're gonna have a lot of, a lot of houses just sitting around. I mean, Mark, these, these houses that Gene is talking about, they're not, they're not even like, like on a main road. They're in your own neighborhood. You probably, you probably, you might even have one in your neighborhood and may not even know it because they look like any other house on the street. Yep. There's not necessarily a sign out front that says, Hey, I mean, it's, it's just a regular house. Well, I'm, I, Gene and I are going to go to lunch. He's going to drive me around and uh, show me all this because well, I'm, I'm, very com I'm coming, I'm coming soon. So uh, wait for me. <laughs> All right. So the three of us are going to go to lunch. We're going to go, we're going to dig into this deeper, but I've got to put on my Andrew Warner hat. Right. Um, he's a tough interviewer. Right. And he's, he's okay, really, uh, he's really skeptical. And so it. Gene, I have to ask you, you've got demographics on your side. You've got economics on your side. You've got, um, you've got almost no competition because when you look at a, a 10 person facility, at, that's a house that is way better than a big box. You don't have any competition. If anything, when you put the two, you juxtapose the two, you want to go to the smaller one, right? So you've got demand on your side. You've got supply on your side. What, what sucks about this business? What, where, where is it that, where is the big bear to entry where you can look at the market and say, well, this is the reason that everybody doesn't do this. Because like you said in the beginning of the podcast, we're all going to be in this situation one day. We're either going to get the checks or we're going to write the checks, right? There's yep. just no, there's no, it's inevitable. There's no other way about it unless you have, you know, some extraordinary family that's larger and, you know, they're going to take you in, right? Um, what sucks about this? You know, barriers to entry, and then I'm going to use the word not sucks, but what's the hardest part of this, right? I'll, I'll switch right. it to what's that. What's the hardest part of this? I'm sorry yeah. to be so crass. No, no, no worries. It's all good. But the concept of barriers to entry, number one, the barrier to entry here is there's paperwork, and I don't mean a lot of it. There's a form you have to fill out. There's inspections you have to do. There's rules you have to follow. I like it that there's some barriers to entry. Because realistically, I need customers, I need clients, I need people lying in the bed. I don't want everybody to do this. Those of us who are smart enough to say I'm willing to do some work, go through those hoops, I'm now on the other side, I'm good. So 
There are some barriers to entry, not really that complicated. If somebody's not willing to do it, frankly, they're going to stop at the first time they hit any roadblock anyway. They're just that kind of uncommitted mentality. But the second part is, what is the hardest part? And I'm going to say people. When I say what is the hardest part and I say it's people, people meaning not just the residents, but the families of the residents, because the residents are fairly easy, meaning it's a human being that needs help and has accepted that. They're living in a home and getting the help. The families, though, sometimes can be demanding. Like, I want you to be perfect. I never want dad to fall. It's so the families can be demanding people. The next one is the manager. I need somebody who's managing this because it's not me. I, I may not go see the home for a month or two, but the manager has to be good at what they do. So I need to find them, train them, retain them, and so on. And I don't have a problem with that, but I need a good manager. Underneath that is the caregivers, and they're getting paid the least. Think minimum wage plus a dollar or two. But it's a different mentality. It's a different person. They're not going to be a barista at Starbucks or a checkout clerk at the store. It's somebody who loves to take care of other people. They wouldn't do anything else, but it's a really hard job. So they do get burned out. They're not going to be there for 38 years. They're going to be there for, you know, a year or two or four, but it's a hard gig. It really, really is. So if I were to say what's the hardest part, it's people and those, your ability to manage that situation is going to really play to your bottom line, how much money you make. So Scott, really what he's saying is that it's just like any other business. It's a business and a business has to be managed by people. Yeah, it, it's, it's a business, right? Like that's the thing is it's a business. And like Gene said, at the end of the day, there's regulation involved. You're going to have the state uh, inspector come to your facility once a year. Uh, and they're going to, they're, they're look inspector <laughs> inspectors, you know, if they don't find something that to me, they didn't do their job, right? Like there, you can always find something somewhere. And so then you got the headache and the hassle behind that you fix it and you move forward. But you know, you're going to, you're going to have stuff that, that, uh, you know, people are going to, you know, look at and you've got to, you've got to run a business. And, I, and I, I really don't want you guys or your listeners to get caught up in the aspect of, of the business part because you can just do the real estate part. Truly just do that if you want and or do the part that I do, the real estate and the business. But the business itself is not as overwhelming as people think. And, and when you said 25% EBITDA, just imagine 25% of the top line gross income coming to the bottom line before taxes. Grocery stores are at 3%. You know, other businesses that are publicly traded lose. Look at Tesla. I mean, they lose more money every quarter than the quarter before, and they're worth tens of billions of dollars. But this business produces real cash flow in the real world. Yeah, I mean, Gene, I, I used to do investment banking, so I looked at companies all day long, and I'm telling you, a great company, a great company, a company that would make us froth at the mouth, had a 15% EBITDA margin, 15%. Your average company is a 10%. I looked at companies all day long less than 10%. 25% is insanity. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking actually, you know, you know what those margins are. It's those are biomedical margins and software mm -hmm. margins. And you, you just, you know, you don't see it a lot. Um, yeah. They're like, they're like unicorn margins in a way. Um, okay. We're at that point in our podcast, Gene, unfortunately, <laughs> that uh, we're going to have to put you on the spot and ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. Your mentorship has been phenomenal. Um, and I have a feeling that everyone who's listening to this podcast is at some point going to have to get into this business. But what do you got for us? Well, there's so many things that I could share. Absolutely. So when you say a tip of the day, can I give a tip or does it have to be an actual physical resource? It can be anything you want. Here you go. Then here's my what you want. You know, everybody's going to get involved in this business one way or the other. So here's my tip. Get prepared. Most people don't even have long-term care insurance to pay for this. So if nothing else, whether you're greedy now or you're being, do one home. Do just one home now so that you could be making your 10 grand a month. If you don't need the money, give it away. But when it's time for you to move in a home, you can move right into the master bedroom and live for free. Don't leave a burden to your kids. Leave them a blessing. You pass away, they get to keep the home and the cash flow. But I see way too many people who they're moving that in. They're trying to make all these decisions at the last minute. They don't know where they're going to come up with five grand a month. Imagine if 
own one home, do it for your kids, if not for yourself. It's pretty powerful. I love it. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? <laughs> Can I steal your tip of the week, Mark? No. Look, <laughs> check, out, check out this t- uh, tip. It's, uh, it's a web, well, it's not a website. It's an app. It's called taskful.me, taskful.me. And I put it in the chat for you, Mark. Oh, I and, want it. Uh, oh smart a, to-do list. So it divides up your to-do list like into, into different tasks and, and uh, you, you know, you mark it up and you can, it, it kind of helps you. So as you're typing stuff, it's, it's thinking, it's trying to figure out what you're, what you're doing. It's color categorizing things. It's giving you task reminders. It's very clean user interface. If you have problems getting your to-do list done, check this out. I'll tell you, what, this is great, but honestly, Scott, like the, the best to-do list that I've, I've found is do, D-U-E on the app store because it won't stop bothering you <laughs> until you do it <laughs> where like if you put it on like your calendar like yesterday yeah, i had to use it well, you, well no it just you you see it and then you don't do it and then you're like oh wait i forgot to water the plants but if i put it on do and like it keeps reminding me water the plants water the plants water the plants and then i get that oh swipe it away when i after i water the plants i might, have, true to, story. I might have to put that on my kids uh phones and it's, it's amazing. Badger it's, just, it's badgering and it's great. <laughs> so um, my tip of the week is the one that's re- really going to change everyone's life. It is RALacademy.com. RALacademy.com. Residential Assisted Living Academy. Um, learn how to do this. There are a lot of moving parts. Uh, have Gene be your Sherpa um, because he'll save you a lot of time. And ultimately, time is money, right? It's, only our, our, it's, it's the only non-renewable resource that we have is our time. So don't start listening to this podcast and start looking to do this, right, without having Gene take you up that mountain. So go to ralacademy.com. Gene and I are going to go to lunch later, and uh, I'm going to start figuring out my future because I certainly don't want to be the one writing the check. I want to be the one collecting the check. You know, I'm, I, Gene, I'm going to live to about you know, 105, by the way. Based, I got a based, bed for you. I got a place for you. No, no, no. I want, <laughs> I want my own bed. Why should, why, should I, why should I write you a check? <laughs> hey, your choice. Up to you, man. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm doing it. I'm definitely I, doing it. Man, I tell my kids I'm going to make it to 147. So, Mark, I got you beat, man. Oh, by the way, Sky, I brought up uh, to my wife about getting a, a plot, like, early. Didn't want to talk about it. Too emotional. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So better do that too. We'll have to talk to her. I know. It's tough. All right. Well, I want to remind all the listeners the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Gene Guarino to come on the podcast from ralacademy.com is if you do us three little favors, you got to subscribe, you got to rate, and you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of the review to support at thelangeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 Passive Income Launch Kit. I want to remind everybody today's podcast is sponsored by geekpay.io. It is the only automated financial CRM in the world. It is a set it, forget it system. Get your recurring payments. If their ACH fails, it'll charge a credit card on file. If the credit card file fails, it'll charge their ACH on file. You have happy customers. They can go on. They're going to save you time. They say, they're not going to call you and say, what's my current balance? You're going to log in and see the current balance. They want to make a prepayment? They can do it. Geekpay.io. It is going to change your life. How's that, Scott? You like that commercial? I love it. All right. Also, uh, you know, go to landgeek.com, learn more. Check out Scott Todd at landmoto.com, scotttodd.net, and most importantly, postingdomination.com forward slash landgeek. I want to thank everybody. And uh, should we do it? I just no. say we. Let's say, just, let freedom ring. Let freedom ring. Gene Guarino, thank you so much. This has been a phenomenal podcast. And uh, we'll see everybody next time. Thank you. Thanks. Gene Guarino. Nice job, guys. When are we going to lunch, man? Hey, we'll, we'll do that. I love the format, by the way, the ability for both of you guys putting in comments. It was a lot more, uh, a lot more fun for me and, and the way you guys banner together. That was great. This is uh, uh, amazing. Wait, am I still recording?